spasticity, an increase in muscle tone and resistance to movement that can occur after many injuries to the central nervous system, including stroke, multiple sclerosis, and spinal cord injury that is often associated with pain, spasms, and involuntary movements. But there are many treatments, and I'll review those today that you can discuss with your own provider, and I'll include some timestamps and references below if you want to skip ahead. Let's have some fun. Now, I won't be too technical, but I want to briefly explain why diseases of the brain and spinal cord cause spasticity. Normally, with voluntary movement, neurons in the primary motor cortex, the upper motor neurons, send axons projecting through the brain, brainstem, and spinal cord, which excite the lower motor neurons, the spinal motor neurons, which in turn stimulate the muscles, causing them to contract. And these are excitatory pathways. However, there are many other pathways regulating the baseline tone of muscles through the muscle stretch receptor, which actually have a net inhibitory effect using the inhibitory neurotransmitter glycine. And as a result, when these nerve fibers are disrupted, either due to injuries in the brain or spinal cord above the area of injury, you can actually see increasing tone, and it often worsens later on, months or years after the injury. And if severe and prolonged and untreated, it can cause significant contractures disrupting the joints and tendons, which actually eventually eventually would no longer respond to some of the treatments I'm going to discuss. So I want to start with some conservative treatments, which really everyone with spasticity should be doing because there's really no risk and they're very underrated and can be quite effective over time. And so with chronic spasticity, you can get some tightening and shortening of the muscles. So it's very important to stretch regularly to maintain the normal length of the muscles. Massage can be very effective, warming and loosening the muscles. And it's really use it or lose it. Physical therapy and exercise are crucial. And of course, a physical therapist has to design a program geared specifically to your injury and the muscles that are spastic. For people with more severe spasticity, bracing, which I'll show on the next slide, can be quite effective to prevent uh, contractures over time. Also, it's just generally important to stay well hydrated, which sort of loosens up and lubricates the muscles. And some people have reported that a diet higher in potassium can prevent muscle spasms and muscle pains. So bananas, potatoes, oranges, tomatoes can be helpful, along with good hydration. And this is just an example of an upper extremity brace, often used after a major stroke, causing paralysis and contracture of the hand. And of course, this would only be used with severe spasticity with limited use of the hand. There's some evidence for nutritional supplements in treating spasticity. Magnesium is a mineral which can stabilize the muscle membrane. And a typical dose of magnesium oxide is 400 milligrams once or twice a day. The amino acid L-threonine actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and is the precursor to glycine, an inhibitory neurotransmitter involved in regulating the muscle tone that I discussed earlier. And there's a study of six grams a day, a very high dose, but quite safe as far as I know, which actually was shown to be beneficial in multiple sclerosis spasticity. Although there was another study on L-threonine showing that it was not effective in multiple sclerosis spasticity. So there's mixed data there, though I have had some patients who thought it was modestly effective. Acupuncture also has evidence in spasticity, as I'll show, along with electrical stimulation of the nerves and muscles using devices such as a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation units, or TENS. So this is a meta-analysis of studies done in acupuncture on post-stroke spastic hemiplegia. So these are people who had a stroke and have paralysis and spasticity of one side of the body. And this is a forest plot showing various studies. And the line in the middle is zero, meaning no benefit of the treatment to the right means greater benefit of the treatment because they were using a functional scale. So more is better. And to the left would favor the placebo. And you can see that some studies showed a benefit and some did not. But on average, there was a benefit. So acupuncture does seem to have a benefit. And this is what transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation does. It can stimulate either the nerves or the muscles. And it's not exactly clear how it works, but it may have some effect of relaxing the muscles. You can actually buy TENS units on Amazon for as little as $20. And there are fancy TENS units that cost thousands of dollars. I couldn't tell you which is better or recommend a specific product. But there was another meta-analysis in post-stroke spasticity showing that they are effective. This is another forest plot. Now they're using a spasticity scale so less is better, so towards the left favors the treatment group. Interestingly, if they looked at studies where the electrode was placed on the muscle belly or the nerve, they were effective, but if the electrode was placed
placed on acupressure points, it was ineffective. And so it would probably be recommended to place the electrodes on the muscle or nerve. And actually, they have fancier versions of transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, such as this proprietary Molly suit. And there is some data on devices such as this as well. But unfortunately, not everyone responds to conservative treatments, so we do have medications for spasticity, and I want to preface by saying this is for informational purposes. Everyone's situation is different, so I would suggest you talk to your own provider and not take this as medical advice. Now, the problem with these drugs is they can all be sedating, and many people can't tolerate them, or maybe they can only take them at night, so they do have their limitations. The most common drug used is baclofen, just because it's sort of the least sedating and has the least drug-drug interaction but even baclofen many people can't tolerate at higher doses. Usually adults would start at 5 milligrams or half of a 10 milligram tablet and take it two to three times daily or maybe just at night if the spasticity is bothering people at night. But some people can take higher doses even up to 160 milligrams a day but very few people would be able to tolerate that kind of dose. Now baclofen works on GABA B receptors in the central nervous system but only a small amount of baclofen less than 5% actually gets gets to where it's supposed to be, and so we can actually bypass this problem by using something called a baclofen pump, which I'll talk about later. Tizanidine or Xanaflex is also used, although it has this effect called QT prolongation sometimes on the heart and can have other drug-drug interactions. Flexural can be effective, although it's quite sedating. Soma is effective, but it's not really used any longer just because there are cases of delirium and confusion, and there are actually several deaths linked to Soma, particularly when it's used in combination with opioids in the setting of chronic pain. Dantrolene is normally given intravenously as a paralytic in during anesthesia, but it can actually be used orally for spasticity, though it can cause liver failure at higher doses, so it's not really a first-line agent, only if many other things have failed, but I have given it to a few patients with success. Some people have tried some other drugs, such as clonidine, which is a blood pressure medication, or Valium, which unfortunately can be quite addictive, and when when spasticity occurs with pain, especially nerve pain, gabapentin can sometimes be effective as well. Now, if you live on planet Earth, you've probably heard about marijuana products used to treat various medical conditions and some of its hype, but there actually is evidence for the use of marijuana in the treatment of spasticity. Now, of course, smoking marijuana can damage the lungs and some people don't like the effects of THC. And so some people have tried cannabidiol oil, which is free of THC. And a typical dose is 20 milligrams per day divided into multiple doses. And marijuana isn't necessarily better than the drugs, though some people find certain certain formulations to be more well tolerated and be less sedating. Now in particular, there's a commercial formulation of synthetic marijuana called Sativex, which is actually a 100 microliter spray approved for multiple sclerosis spasticity in Europe, but not the United States. And it has a roughly equal amount of THC and CBD. And the trial is very famous. They had 189 participants and they did a six week randomized double blind study and they found that Sativex was superior to placebo in decreasing increasing spasticity as measured by the Ashworth score. They also did a functional score measured by something called the numeric rating scale spasticity score. And you can see the solid line, the Sativex, they had less spasticity based on this functional score compared to the placebo, the dotted line above. Though some people did have side effects, in particular dizziness and fatigue, but most people tolerated it quite well. Now for people who have spasticity in particular areas, intramuscular Botox can be effective. Botox is botulinum toxin, you know, the reason that you can't give honey to infants. And it actually blocks the release of vesicles at the neuromuscular junction containing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which normally causes muscles to contract. So it's actually a paralytic agent which relaxes the muscles. And it may be counterintuitive that weakening the muscles could be beneficial, but if injected into specific target areas, it can be helpful without significantly impairing function. Now I do inject Botox, and it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis of whether or not it could be helpful. I find it to be quite helpful in post-stroke spasticity of the upper extremity. And some people with spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis, if they have tightening of the inner thigh muscles causing the knees to pull in towards each other, causing scissoring of gait, then injections into the inner thigh muscles, the adductor compartment, can be very helpful. Also, some people have inversion at the ankle and injections into the posterior tibialis can be very effective. 
effective. Now there is a maximum dose because a small amount of Botox can get absorbed within the system and people rarely could have swallowing difficulties and other problems even when the Botox is injected far away. So I usually personally wouldn't give more than 400 units although some people do give a little bit more than that. The other side effects are local bleeding in some cases but it's generally fairly safe. There is a study interestingly in spinal cord injury and spasticity comparing physical therapy versus Botox injections versus oral baclofen. And they all sort of improved after six weeks. You can see the gradual upward trend. And they use something called the Barthel Index of Functional Outcome, which is actually a 0 to 100 scale of functional activity. 100 is completely independent. And of course, these are people with spinal cord injuries, so most of them were not completely independent. But there was a gain in function, but all of the treatments were roughly equal to each other, suggesting that these therapies all work and they can be used in combination. Now for people with more significant spasticity of the lower extremities who can't tolerate higher doses of baclofen, one option is a baclofen pump, which is a surgical procedure where a pump is installed and then a wire is connected directly into the spinal column, allowing the delivery of higher doses of baclofen without causing systemic side effects. And I find this to be very effective. Now it's most commonly used in people with significant weakness of the lower extremities who are not walking, although some people who are walking can still benefit from it, although the dose may have to be slightly lower to not cause too much limpness of the muscles. Now, generally speaking, you would do a trial of baclofen first, so you would have a spinal tap and baclofen is injected into the spinal column once, and you would sort of be evaluated and see if you like the effects prior to actually having the surgical procedure. But once you have the procedure, the dose can be titrated. You can start at a lower level and go up slowly and do physical therapy along the way and it can be very beneficial in my experience particularly in people who have a lot of lower extremity muscle pain associated with their spasticity. One additional benefit is that some of these modern devices can actually adjust the dose throughout the day so you get less during the day so you have more strength and more at night so you can relax and sleep and some people report that if they have associated neurogenic bladder have difficulty urinating it may reduce the bladder tone and allow people to urinate a little bit better as well. There are some other treatments as well. One of them is dry needling, which is kind of similar to acupuncture, but the needle is advanced into the muscle many times, traumatizing it. This is mostly used for treatment of pain, such as muscular pain conditions, but some people report that it's beneficial for spasticity. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, creating a magnetic field in the brain, has complicated effects on the nervous system and has been studied in depression, but may also be beneficial in spasticity, along with transspinal magnetic stimulation, the same thing but in the spine, and in severe cases of spinal cord injury with severe lower extremity spasticity, a surgical procedure called dorsal rhizotomy has been performed, which of course would be a last case resort. And just to show you some pictures, this is a woman getting transcranial magnetic stimulation, and there are various devices, and this was actually studied in a small pilot trial in 16 people with multiple sclerosis, and they did note a at one week and one month after the treatment, there was a decrease decrease in spasticity as measured by the modified Ashworth scale. And this was not a randomized study, but it seems like it may be beneficial. And this is just a picture of someone getting the dry needling procedure. It's also used for back pain and other treatments, so it probably wouldn't look like this for spasticity, but this is just an example. So I'd love to know, do you have spasticity? Have you tried any of these treatments? And what are your results? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?